All right. Say ETM Hotep, uh, as well as Beck and the Fair, which is a uh, good morning. It is um, early Monday morning, 9 a.m. This is your brother Wu Zhao, and um, doing once again a quick bite size uh, lesson for today. Um, and this is a continuation of different lessons that we'll be putting together and um, making them very short and simple. And like I said, bite-sized, digestible, so that people can learn, um, we'll hope <laughs> that people will learn from these lessons. And if you have any questions about anything that's discussed, uh, feel free to comment in the chat. Um, whether you're watching live um, or, or um, come in after and watching it through the archive. All right, either way, uh, I will try to check the comments as frequent as I can. Now I'm doing these... Uh, videos pretty much kind of unannounced not as an event to bring about viewers uh, live but if you happen to be in the in the Facebook group and are chimed in then I appreciate it and if you have any questions I will once I've finished I will check out the um, chat to see if any questions are here and I can answer them right now all right so for today we're gonna do a quick lesson in Egyptian adjectives all right, I label this part one because adjectives can can be or the discussion of adjectives can get very lengthy. So I'll just do this as a part one to keep it short and simple. And then we'll do other parts, maybe um, part two and maybe even possibly a part three. All right. So I want to start off with the basics. And I would like to reiterate that these short lessons are not meant to be um, an exhaustive study. Obviously, that's what we have the classes for the study courses for and I encourage everyone to sign up for those if you're interested in learning the language of ancient Kemet that we know as Rani Kemet as the spoken language and Sesmetanetra as one of the writing systems that people are familiar with as hieroglyphs so that's what that's for but these are um, these videos are basically summaries all right just giving you a, a tidbit of the information that you can learn and hopefully you can do do benefit from them all right so we'll just dive straight in to this particular lesson. So this lesson is on Egyptian adjectives uh, part one. All right. So the first question is what are adjectives? And adjectives are a syntactic category of words used to modify, describe, or qualify a noun, a noun phrase, or a pronoun giving more information about the referent. Accordingly, Adjectives indicate such things as size and measurement, and we have words as tall and long, feelings or qualities such as lonely and honest, nationality or origin such as Kenyan, American, characteristics of something being flashy or sharp, age, whether something is young or old, properties, whether it's made of wood or cotton, shapes, whether it's round or square, uh, Judgment or value of things when we say things are awesome or pointless. Uh, the condition of something um, being rugged or volatile. Uh, colors of things such as green, blue, black, white. Or weight of things, whether it's heavy or light. All right. So that's what adjectives, and we're familiar with them. We, we use them every day in English. Um, and we learn about adjectives or the different so-called parts of speech in grade school. All right, so this should be come off pretty easy to everyone. But here are some examples in Rodney Kemet. All right, so we have an examples of adjectives of value, color, shape, weight, size, and condition. So um, these are two examples of pretty much the opposing ends of both of these, of each one of these uh, categories. So we have for value, we have good, which is nefer. We have bad, which is bin. Uh, col color, we have desher, which is red. And we have chem, which is black. For shape, we have shifu, which is swollen. We have uh, wasek, which is wide. For weight, we have uh, denes, which is heavy. And we have isi, which is light. For size, we have najes, small, and ah, which is big. 
uh, condition, we have strong and the khit, and then we have hisi, which is weak. So those are just some of the examples uh, within uh, Rodney Kemet of adjectives, all right, just to bring clarity to how they are in Rodney Kemet as opposed to how we deal with it in English. Now, Rodney Kemet uh, adjectives may be divided into two main categories. One is qualifying adjectives and the other is relational adjectives, which are also called nisba adjectives. And that may be a word that some people who study Arabic may be familiar with uh, because the word nisba is from the Arabic word and it means relation. And it's used in Arabic grammar to form adjectives of relations or pertinence. All right. Like when we say um, Arabi and things like that, it means of Arabic or of Arab and things. All right. So we're going to deal with with um, the qualifying adjectives first and then we'll move to the relational adjectives. All right. And like I said, I want to keep this short. So I'll just only deal with these two categories and then we'll uh, separate into another part. For another time so the first category of adjectives are qualifying adjectives so a qualifying adjective is an adjective that denotes either a property or a property and an entity at the same time one of the most common qualifying adjectives is nefer now we hear that a lot um, and when denoting just a property it means good or beautiful but when denoting a property and an entity together, it means good one or beautiful one. All right. So please take note of of the difference. So so when we're talking about an attribute or a property of something that's isolated as good or beautiful. But when you're talking about the property and the entity to which it refers, we would have to translate it as good one or beautiful one. Denoting the, the attribute or property and the entity itself. OK, so keep that in mind. That's important. Now, qualifying adjectives that refer only to property are used as predicates, also referred to as predicative adjectives or predicative adjectives in adjectival sentences. All right. In this use, they are invariable. That is, they exhibit no declensional endings for gender or number except the simple form of masculine singular. Now that may seem like a mouthful to to uh, to digest right there, but what this is simply saying is that um, in many languages, words are conjugated for um, different reasons, where different suffixes or affixes are added to words to kind of make an agreement between gender and number uh, and things like that. And conjugation is usually attached to verbs, whereas declension is what we use when we call it, when we when we see this phenomenon with nouns as well as adjectives all right so in other words if i say in english book and then i say books plural i have to add the suffix s that s suffix on in order to um denote plurality all right so invariable meaning that they don't show these declensional endings for gender and number so they are unchanged all right so adjectival sentences will be taken up in a later lesson however as an example so here's an example so we're not going to talk about it but just to show an example of what i'm referring to so in the language we have nefer heret ten and it's this means this flower is beautiful now notice that the adjective beautiful or the word nefer it's in the predicate so notice up here, it says that uh, qualifying adjectives that refer only to a property are used as predicates. Okay, only used as predicates. And so in English, in this translation, we have this flower is beautiful. And notice that the predicate is is beautiful. And the adjective itself is beautiful. All right. Now in the language, nefer comes first. The predicate comes first. In this instant, nefer heret ten. All right, but like I said, that is for a later example, and it's really for probably a more advanced, um, you know, discussion. 
But now, uh, also note that in the example, the noun heret, which is for flower, is feminine. You have the feminine ending of the T. And it's singular, while the predicate adjective, nefer, is masculine singular. So this is, this is demonstrating that even though the object to which this adjective is trying to modify is a feminine and singular, the adjective itself does not match that gender or number. The adjective is masculine and singular. All right, and this is what it's meant by invariable. All right, so to move on. Now, for qualifying adjectives that refer to a property and an entity, these are variable. Okay, that is, they have the same declensional endings as substantives for gender and number. Now, a note on the word substantive. Uh, this is commonly known as nouns. All right, there, there are different reasons why linguists and grammarians may use the word noun or the word substantive. All right, I choose the word to use the word substantive because of later on in the learning the grammar, you'll learn about substantive phrases and adjectival phrases, prepositional phrases and adverbial phrases and things like that so it becomes uh, clearer when we keep these uh, separate all right now the gender and number endings refer to the entity denoted by the adjective so here's some examples here's the declension of the adjective nefer okay with nefer as example so we have in the masculine singular we have nefer masculine dual it would be neferwi in the plural, it would be neferu. In feminine singular, it would be neferet. In a dual, it would be neferetti. Or some people may pronounce it neferti. And in the plural, it would be neferut. All right? So here's just a, a diagram just to kind of summarize uh, the two different qualifying adjectives. So we have qualifying adjectives that denote just a property only. They are invariable, meaning that they don't show the declensional endings all right then you have the qualifying adjectives that denote a property and an entity at the same time and they are variable meaning that they do show the declensional endings to match the referent as the example we showed all right now qualifying adjectives that denote a property and an entity may be used independently or dependently okay when used independently they function as substantives that is subst substantival adjectives and rem remember mind you this word sub substantive or uh, substantival adjective is what people refer to as nouns so in this way they function as nouns and they're referred to as substantival adjectives. Some people may call them noun adjectives or nominal adjectives. Now, the reason why um, they're called this is because, in fact, in the grammatical tradition of Greek and Latin, from which many descriptive linguistic terms originate, adjectives were considered one subtype of nouns along with substantives being the other. So, in other words, we have the category of nouns, nomen. Okay, in Latin it's nomen. There were two types of nomen or two types of nouns. There was the ad adjectivum in Latin, and then there was the su substantivum in Latin. And today the substantivum became our nouns and the adjectivum became our adjectives. But both of these were classed as nom nomen, which are nouns in Latin. So I hope that's not confusing. So in other words, in, in the early grammarians, when they were putting together grammar for Latin and Greek, they had a category of nouns, but they called it nomen. And then they divided it into two parts, adjectivum and substantivum. And today, we took on the word nomen to mean noun for the substantivum, and then we used the word adjective for the adjectivum. All right. So keep that in mind. 
So as an example of a qualifying adjective used independently is this. So we have the word neferet. We see the, the feminine T on the end. And it means beautiful one. Where nefer refers to the property of beautiful and the raised bread loaf. This is a raised bread loaf glyph of a T suffix ending refers to a singular feminine entity, one. Now, looking at this word, we are not informed on whether the singular feminine entity is human, an animal, or a thing, or what have you. So usually what the scribes did in this case, they would put a determinative after it to assist with informing us of what it's referring to. So here's some examples of that. So we have a masculine word, wab which means pure one and the word wab means pure one and it and with the determinative of a kneeling man now we know it is referring to a male figure pure human or a human in the feminine we have neferet as example I just mentioned meaning beautiful one and with just this we don't know what it's referring to whether it's a human an animal or a thing but with the determinative of a bovine or a bull or a cow, we know that it's talking about an animal. Neferet, beautiful bovine or beautiful cow. All right. So that's the use of determinatives with adjectives. They are for those qualifying adjectives that denote a property and an entity. All right. So now when used dependently, they are ref often referred to as attributive adjectives and have the following characteristics. So number one, they're placed after the substantive to which they refer, forming a, a substantival phrase, which is explained you know, later on in a later lesson. Uh, and two, they agree with the substantive in gender and number. Some examples are the following so we have set waret and the word set means a seat a chair something that you sit on and waret means great so waret is the adjective and set is the noun set waret now notice that it forms a phrase and they agree in gender and number so the, the word set is feminine and singular and the adjective waret is feminine and singular now, what's different between in, in this case from us in English is that we place our adjectives before the noun. So in English, notice that it would, we would say great seat. But in Rodney Kimmett, it's actually in reverse. Seat, great. Set is seat and waret is great. But it wouldn't make sense to us like that. And the same thing is in Spanish. Spanish, we would say um, Casa Blanca for white house even though casa is house and blanca is white. So literally you, you're saying house white, but in English we would reverse it and say white house. So that's a feminine example. And here's a masculine example. We have netra a. And people, a lot of people should be familiar with this phrase. Netra a means great God or the great divinity. And um, this is a masculine singular netra and a masculine singular adjective a. And notice that the adjective, again, it comes after the noun to describe it. All right. So now, the, in this case, these are qualifying adjectives that are used dependently. And they're referred to as attributive adjectives. All right. Now, as a note, there may also be ha they may also have abbreviated endings. And they're reduced to a minimum. So here's an example. So thus, in the feminine plural... The ending WT, which is a feminine plural ending, will often be reduced to just T alone. So this W, uh, the glyph that represents that W will often be omitted from the writing system. Okay, scribes tended to omit that uh, W and it'll be reduced just to the raised bread loaf alone or the T. So it'll, it'll look like uh, a feminine singular. So here's an example. We have the word Wawet. Neferet. Now, looking at this, we would just say Wawet Neferet because there's no glyph to indicate the W. So, what we do 
we would put the W inside of parentheses to let the reader know in our transliterations that it's an omitted glyph and that it should be read or understood that it's feminine and plural. So we would properly say this as Wawet Neferut and it means beautiful roads. Wawet meaning roads, pathways, and Neferet or Neferut meaning beautiful in the plural. All right. So I hope everyone is uh, following along who will be watching this in the archives. But again, like I said, um, feel free to type in the comments uh, any any questions. And, and also, I want to reiterate that this is not meant to be an exhaustive, you know, class. Uh, that's what I have to study courses are reserved for just that. I just want to touch on a few things in these bite sized lessons to, you know, make things uh, aware to people that you know beyond the the um whether the language has been deciphered and and all the other things that we've been seeing for the past two years you know it's time to really get busy and learn uh some actual information that's useful you know so i'm going to skip this part and i'm going to go to uh this part here that's speaking about the second type of overall adjectives remember there were two major types qualifying adjectives and relational adjectives that are referred to as nisba adjectives all right now what are they nisba adjectives are formed from substantive which they have a substantival form or prepositions and we call it we refer to them as prepositional forms and they're done so by adding the suffix of a y which is indicated in the glyphs as two diagonal strokes OK, um, this Y is, is added in the masculine singular, which is written before the determinatives. So like qualifying adjectives, Nisba adjectives refer to properties and their meaning indicates a relation with the term from which they are derived. So in other words, we would have to add the notion of the one from or the one who is or that which is from or that which is. In, in our translations, we would have to make note of that. So remember, there's two kinds of Nisba adjectives. They're derived either from nouns, which we refer to as substantives, or they are derived from prepositions. So we're gonna we're gonna go over the su substantival form first. Now the substantival form of a Nisba adjective that is derived from a substantive and shows the same declensional endings as qualifying adjectives. That is, we have the substantive itself, or the noun, plus the Y, and then whatever endings that are involved to agree with gender and number. All right. When a Nisba adjective is derived from a substantive, that substantive may originally be masculine or it may be feminine. Regardless of the gender of the original substantive, the resulting Nisba adjective will have a full set of adjectival endings expressing gender and number. Among other things, this means that masculine substantives may give rise to feminine Nisba forms, just as feminine substantives may give rise to masculine Nisba forms. In both the singular and plural, and duals are exceptionally rare. So they do, do exist, but they're exceptionally rare. Now, the Y ending is frequently omitted when writing nisbas. That's something that um, we have to make sure we understand. And in those cases, only the context and experience allow all ambiguity to be removed. Now that, that may have been a, a mouthful, so let me just kind of um, put this another way, what I just read in this paragraph. Uh, basically, what this is saying is that, uh, let's take here, I'll highlight it. The substantive, the nisba ending, and the gramma the uh, gender and number or declensional ending uh, together, what this is saying is that the substantive itself can be masculine or feminine. And when you when you're trying to describe something that is feminine, then you would show it in the endings here. So although let's say for example the substantive is feminine. 
originally. And then you want to make it into a nisbi, but you want to make it refer to a masculine entity. So although the substantive was originally feminine, your nisba would be masculine by placing a masculine ending onto the nisba. And so I'm going to show examples uh, are going to come up. So here are some examples. Hopefully this will clarify it. So nisba adjectives that are derived from masculine substantives or masculine nouns. The following nisba adjective is used as a paradigm for nisba adjectives derived from masculine nouns or masculine substantives. So this, this is the uh, nisba adjective netchiri and it means divine one. And it's derived from the substantive nature, which is God. This is a masculine singular noun or substantive. God, nature. Or we could say divine. Now, when we say nature, we're saying divine one. And it means one pertaining to this noun, which is God. So something pertaining to divinity or God would be divine. So this is why it's translated as divine one. So to show how this works, we have the masculine singular, it would be nechiri. In feminine, it would be nechirit. Notice that, notice that the word nature itself is masculine. That would be the substantive or the noun. We have the Y. It won't let me highlight it. But the Y here is for the nisba ending. And then we have the gender. So it started off as masculine. It became a nisba adjective, and we want to denote feminine. So now it becomes a feminine nisba adjective, nechirit. Likewise, in the plural, we have uh, nechiriu, nechiriu, or nechiriu. And then we also have in the feminine, nechiriut, or wet. Different people may pronounce it differently. All right. So in other words, this will be divine one for masculine, divine one for feminine, divine ones, plural, for masculine, and divine ones, plural, for feminine. And again, the dual is rare. Now, to show the ones, the nisba adjectives derived from feminine substantives or feminine nouns. So the following nisba adjective is used as a paradigm for nisba adjectives derived from feminine substantives. So we have this nisba here, meheti, and it means northern one, or one who is of the north. The word for north is mehet. That's a cardinal point, north. So meheti will be one related to the north, or one who is from the north, or we would simply say northern, northern one. Now, to break this down, we have the masculine singular. We have maheti, northern one. Feminine, it would be mahetit. Masculine plural, it would be mahetiu. And in the feminine plural, we have mahetiut. Now, I'm going to come back to this mahetiu in a second. Now, the ending of the masculine plural nisbi adjectives which are derived from feminine substantives are usually written with the G4 glyph, which is a buzzard. And it represents this ending, the TU ending that you see here. And you see the buzzard here inside of the glyphs. And it's not to be mistaken with the G1, which is the vulture that a lot of people are familiar with, which is the vulture glyph. All right, they look alike in the glyphs, but you can tell if, if there's no damage to the surface uh, a lot of these glyphs that we see are, um, of course, thousands of years old. But if you actually look at one that's in very good shape, you can clearly, clearly see the difference. But um, with a little damage, some people may mistake the buzzard here, G4, with the vulture, G1. So I'm here pointing this out, uh, not to be confused with that. All right. But now, I said I was going to come back to the TU because... <clears throat> This word here, mehet, is feminine. A lot of toponyms or place names, geographical locations, are feminine by uh, default in Rani Kemet language. 
So Mehet as a cardinal point is feminine. Mehet, it means the north. And so if I say Meheti, uh, as you see here, I'm trying to describe a person from the north or something from the north. But that thing is masculine, gender. Not meaning masculine as in a man or male, but masculine in gender. All right, and, and, and we'll do a lesson on gender in Rodney Kemet as well because people confuse gender with sexual orientation or sexual gender and we shouldn't confuse that uh, but anyway we have the plural if I want to refer to more than one thing or person from the north I would have to say Mehetiu because the original noun from which the Nisbi is derived is feminine Mehet so I have to add the Nisbi ending which is the Y then I have to add the plurality ending, which is the W that you see here. So it becomes Mehetiu. So likewise, when we say things like Kemetiu, and sometimes you may hear people say Kemet, referring to the country or the kingdom of Kemet. And then you may hear people refer to the people of Kemet as the Kemetiu. And so this is the same thing. Kemet is a feminine noun it's a toponym and so if i want to create a nisba adjective for that noun and i want to describe people that are from that location then i would have to say commit to you in the masculine but in the feminine i would have i would say commit to you i would say commit to you all right keep that in mind and lastly, this will be the last thing, because like I said, I want to try to keep this uh, digestible. <laughs> so in the masculine singular, Nisbi adjectives that are derived from feminine substantives or nouns have similar appearance to dual feminine substantives. And both of them end in T-Y. All right. So a distinction is made in this grammar. And by the way, th what I'm uh, quoting from and reading from and going over it are um, snippets from the upcoming grammar book uh, that will be available in the spring. All right. So this is why you see this here. So a distinction is made in this grammar by using uh, the usual dot to separate the declensional endings in the feminine dual substantive and no dot in the masculine singular nisbi derived from the feminine substantive. So. For example, we have these two glyphs here. Uh, I nicknamed these glyphs uh, the X-Men belt buckle because it's, it's like a looks like an X within a circle. And it's the glyph that denotes a toponym, a village, city or municipality or a place that people can gather and live. That's pretty much what that um, sign represents, the glyph represents. And it is the word niut. All right. Now, when you see both of these here, it can p have two possible meanings. It can either be a feminine dual, which which in that case it would mean two cities, and it would be we would say it as niuti to show the feminine. And notice that I separated with a dot, as I said up here. I use a dot to show the feminine. The ending and no dot when it when it's being used as a nisba so in the feminine dual you see the dot niuti two cities that's what this means two cities now as a nisba it would mean one relating to the city or we would simply say a local and it's transliterated as niuti as well but without the dot so this would signify to us as readers in the transliteration that this one is feminine and plural um, excuse me feminine and dual and this one is not this one is a masculine singular nisba and the dot and the lack of will help us determine that so additionally the dual writing of niuti which ought to mean two cities if it were a feminine dual subst substantive is used in a playful manner to write the nisba niuti, which means related to the city, as in the phrase netcher netcher niuti, which means city god or local god, 
And literally, it would mean the God that pertains to this particular city. All right. So like I said, that was the last and I, want, I don't want to go further. I'll save that for another lesson. Like I said, I want to keep this uh, digestible and brief as possible. But I will see if anyone is watching and take any questions that somebody may have. I'll take a few. And if not, I'll conclude and hopefully this will save in the archives in the group, the Facebook group, and people can view it and maybe have questions uh, later. Maybe want to look into some things and or have to read it and go over it again. This may be brand new to uh, a lot of people and it's no worries because um, we do this all the time. Uh, I have classes that are available for beginners and this year I will be rolling out an intermediate class dealing with the grammar. Uh, in our Seshu Mani Metternature Facebook group, we talk about these things all the time. That's what the group is for. We deal with all things Kemet in its language, um, writing systems, culture, uh, spirituality, and the likes. All right. So I'm going, I'm trying to check the chat now. All right, so um, hard to kill people's belief with facts, though. <laughs> All right, Carl Smith, when will you share the video that pertains to gender? Um, well, it's not a video yet. Uh, like I said, I will do another lesson on that. So I'll, I'll do a short lesson on the gender and we could do that next. So, um, yeah, that's that's just what I'll do. And, and I also take recommendations, you know. Uh, right now, it's, it's just me doing this one, but we have a, a team of, of us uh, refer to ourselves as the Seshu Ma'ani Meta Nature. And so there will be others that will join me or others that will um, take the driver's seat and go over these brief lessons as well. All right. So look for it as an upcoming lesson. I may do it later on today. Uh, let's see. Anything else? Okay, yeah, no problem, uh, Carl. No problem. And yeah, please make suggestions. Any Anything that you would like to see uh, discussed uh, in regards to the language, then let us know. And we'll do our best to get to it. Because, you know, I put in, I put in the group a, a post because, you know, there has to be a change in how we deal with knowledge and information. You know, 2008, one of the missions uh our missions is to change the paradigm you know we want to, we want people to progress in knowledge and set up a very very clean uh professional environment structured so that people can learn you know remember in grade school elementary school when we were in class as children we were restless you know we wanted to play we were restless but in the classroom we had to be disciplined we had to pay attention we had to behave we had to be quiet and attentive and learn our lesson. And then when the school bell rang for recess, that's when we go outside and we would cut up and have fun, play some ball, kickball, softball, whatever the case is, we would have fun outdoors. And then when we come back in, we would have to get serious again and learn our lessons. So likewise, even as adults, we have to we have to separate the times that we have fun and, you know, we need we need that part as well, but we have to be able to get busy, get serious. And so that's one of our missions this year is to leave the other uh, things behind the drama and things. And I already posted it up inside of the group and really develop more structured, um, good environments for learning. And so part of that effort is why I'm doing or we're doing these bite-sized lessons so that people can actually learn something and take it and it's in small little pieces all right don't want to overwhelm people that's what the classes are for so we offer classes we have a complete study course a beginner study course is only 12 weeks and technically it's only 12 24 hours total because we meet two hours once a week for 12 weeks Two times 12 is 24. So if we could stay awake for 24 hours and digest it, then we, we could teach a whole beginner's course in a 24-hour period. But we don't do that. It's two hours um, once a week. Meet once a week. And I have several different class groups. So if you're interested, you can definitely inbox or go to our website 
and all the information is there to sign up and you can actually register. And I, I will be starting a class group um, very, very soon, another class group. Just finished up a class group with uh, students from Uganda. Um, started off with 11 students from Uganda. So there is, there are connections between us here in the diaspora with um, Africans on the continent. And I'll be starting a, a new group of uh, people who are living in uh, Tanzania. All right. And you would be surprised at the information that um, they can share. Like in my class with the with the Uganda group, while they're learning from me, I'm also learning from them. And it's a very, very good exchange of information where when we discuss different committee uh, inscriptions or ideas about the language, they can actually see it in their living traditions to this very day. And we have good discussions about that. So anyway, I don't want to uh, prolong this too much. And um, I was stalling a little bit to try to see if there was any, any questions. But since there's not, no questions, by all means, have uh, questions later if you watch it on archive um, and you didn't get, get a chance to catch it live. And I may come back and do another one later this evening on gender. So, uh, Brother Carl, uh, you know, just be on the lookout for that. If you don't catch it live, it will definitely be inside of the archive as well. All right. And um, yeah, I guess basically that is it. I do want to remind folks of the websites or the publications at the very least. All right, so hopefully on the screen, you can see on the screen uh, our three publications, the textbook on the left, the Beginner's Introduction to Meta Nature, the Ancient Egyptian Hieroglyphic Writing System. In the middle is our latest publication, Simplified Sesh Meta Nature Penmanship, a lesson in Egyptian hieroglyphic writing, book one, monoliterals, written by Sonet Emiket Aku Kinshaya Kenyi. And the one, the book on the right is the uh, rebuttal book called Has the Egyptian Hieroglyphic Writing System Been Deciphered? A Rebuttal to Professor Walter Williams. Addressing the claim about the glyphs, hieroglyphs not being deciphered. You know, I know more recent times, other people have been uh, trying to push forward that agenda. Uh, but it goes back some time to Professor Walter Williams, who actually put it in a book in a more scholarly uh, fashion. So we opted to address the claims that he made in his uh, book, The uh, African Origins of Christianity. And so we addressed it, not the whole book of or the subject of Christianity or the African origins of Christianity, but there's a portion in his book in the appendix related to the decipherment or the lack of decipherment of the language. And that's what we addressed in, our, in that book. So support and pick up those books and you you'll definitely um, hopefully you definitely uh, walk away edified. All right. So with that, I will say uh, Shimon Hotep and I may come back on later on this evening. All right. So remember, this is part one about dealing with uh, Egyptian adjectives. Hotel.